everyone. I just want to give a very short uh, introduction to both Lana and Sara before we start. So Lana is an artist in residency for February and March, and her residency is generously sponsored by Trust for Mutual Understanding. She is a visual artist working in the field of artistic research. She utilizes performative and stage photography, textile, costumes, and architectural models to explore themes such as illegal construction, architectural and industrial heritage, environmental pollution, contemporary new style tendencies, devastation of culture, heritage, and the transformation of the landscape as a result of mass tourism. She works as an assistant professor at the Department of Art, Education, and Fine Arts of the Arts Academy of Split, where she lives and works. She has uh, numerous professional awards, such as the Radus Lokudar Award, Institute of Contemporary Art, Zagreb 2021, the third uh, Ivan Kojraish Award, Museum of Contemporary Art, Zagreb 2021, the Metro Imaging Award of the New East Photo Prize Exhibition, Calvert 2022 Foundation, London 2016, the Annual Award for Young Artists, uh, Croatian Assist, uh, Association of Artists, Zagreb 2015. And we are honored to have Sara Garrison here for this uh, conversation. She is an assistant curator at Canal Projects in New York. She is also a founding, a founding member of Collective Rewilding, a curatorial working group that researches the intersection between art, ecology, and care. Sara has worked as an Jane and Morgan Whitney curatorial fellows as well as Lifters Stronish, if I'm pronouncing it correct, <laughs> <laughs> curatorial fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and as audience engagement associate at the Brooklyn Museum. Besides museum appointments, Sara has also curated a number of exhibitions and has contributed to several exhibition catalogs, anthologies, peer review journals, and art magazines, including Arts of the Working Class, Eflux, Artishock, Oculo Magazine, Terremoto, Hyperallergic, and others. So we will start, and if you have any questions, I think we will leave it at the end. So please, uh, start thank you thank you <laughs> all right um hello everyone thank you for joining us today um it is my pleasure to be able to actually have this conversation in person with Lana, with whom myself, alongside my colleagues at Collective Rewilding, have had a number of exchanges and collaborations. Uh, with Collective Rewilding, we have focused on the topic of masterism, seeing how central it has become to foreground larger conversations and questions that deal with the responsibilities and ethics of artistic and curatorial work today. At the intersection of many of the questions that we raised uh, around art and ecology uh, emerges a question of place and how in the midst of an environmental crisis, we needed to dis uh, kind of delineate systems of repair that foreground relationships or, and repairs relationships with the many human and non-human worlds that surround us. So that in looking at the intersection of museum work, cultural patrimony, and environmental tourism, the tourist gaze uh, seemed to us as one of the forces that has ironically received very little critical attention. Um, in this kind of line of work, we have raised a number of questions around how have art and art institutions historically participated in constructing a particular view of the world and relationships to place that make viewers believe that they enter a place like one enters into a picture. How many times have we as cultural producers reiterated the idea that the world is only an image, an object of consumption and appropriation? And how have the histories of display helped us objectify the world and its peoples? At Collective Rewilding, we have been particularly inspired by the work of Jorge Luis Marzo uh, and others on tourism. This is a catalog that he and some colleagues produced a few years back in the context of Barcelona, dealing again with the issues of uh, mass tourism and the impact in particular kind of coastal cities. Um, and this particular book, catalog and exhibition project um, raised uh, more so than anything, the idea of tourism as an ism, right? As a style or as a manifestation of modernity, a modernism. Um, and situates the viewer, the modern viewer, and the modern city amidst a conundrum of modern visualities designed to separate and abstract or to consume and extract. 
So the hope of today's conversation is to unpack our shared with Lana, um, our shared interest in the tourist case, and discuss how through an overview of Lana's critical work, uh, a few ideas um, that, we, that we shared throughout the years have brought us together in really thinking about the implications of the construction and dissemination of a particular idea of place through the distribution and kind of reestablishment of the tourist case. So for that, I was hoping that maybe Lana can start by situating us back in place. Not only in the context and histories of the Croatian coast, but also in the ways in which through its rich architectural and landscapes, sorry, architectural landscapes and patrimony, Croatia has lent itself as a site for thinking about the values that the built environment today has in generating an ambiguous sense of place, of belonging, right, of rootedness. Architecture, I would say Heidegger, through its built forms, makes sites, both natural and artificial, gain value as they become connected through collective memories that make and create uh, recognizable characteristics of a place. However, today, more so than reminiscing on the possibilities granted by architecture, we would like this talk to be more about the emerging materialities and sensibilities provided by the homogenized tourist gaze. Uh, how tourism, with its demands and expectations, appeals to a new sense of style, a new ornament, as Lana has claimed and coined in her work, and created, uh, has created instead a built environment that builds us back. In that regard, what, uh, we raise a question, and for me, this has been really important in thinking about the work of Lana. What are the effects of the constructed imaginaries created for those who, through their demands, claim ownership to place, albeit these being temporary, idealized, and homogenized views, um, and how these communities, uh, or these views, place communities, certain kinds of communities, at increasing um, risk? What are, what, what are we to make of the tourist materialities that, make, um, that are made by the masses to feel like they are somewhere? but nowhere in particular. And we'll, I think we'll give depth to some of these questions as we go through some of your work and the incredible kind of visual forms that Lana has provided in questioning and dismantling also the implications of masterism in Croatia. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the Croatian coast. So th uh, Mariam, thank you for the introduction and of course uh, Sara also and thank you all for joining, joining our uh, public event. Uh, I'll start a bit with uh, just the local context uh, where I live and where I grew up. Uh, so I, as we already mentioned, live in uh, Croatia uh, in the city of Split. Um, and that's a coastal part of, uh, coastal part of Croatia. And this is a um, reconstruction of uh, Diocletian's palace, uh, Roman uh, palace that was built in, uh, in uh, that was built on a location uh, of today's Split and then the whole city uh, was built around that specific uh, palace and um, this is how Split uh, looks now and uh, it somehow um, I'm, I'm quite inspired by the fact that I live in this specific place and all my works are somehow related to Dalmatia, that coastal part of Croatia. And uh, this is of course just an image to, um, uh, to point out that uh, we have like mass tourism that is also somehow, of course, related to the cultural heritage that, that we inherited somehow. Um, and this, this image uh, reminds us of uh, how do we sometimes deal with that heritage and uh, the way that uh, since we inherited something that is uh, quite important uh, in the context of tourism and uh, obsessive, uh, ob we are obsessed with putting uh, all those air conditions everywhere to have uh, tourist departments in the city centers and um, this is some, these are just some, some, some of the examples of uh, how do we devastate something that we inherited, uh, so we devastate our cultural heritage. And uh, this is also um, one, uh, the other side of the city, uh, uh, since we have a, a quite important uh, modernist heritage, uh, so, so modernist architecture uh, that is also part of, uh, like important part of uh, identity of, of the city. And um, <clears throat> when I uh, so th this is uh, just a, this is an example of uh, modernist heritage of Split, and now I'll uh, continue with uh, modernist heritage uh, in Croatia, not not just in Split, 
but uh, modernist heritage that was that was built during the uh, Yugoslavia, Yugos Croatia used to be part of uh, part of. Uh, bigger country called Yugoslavia and after the collapse of Yugoslavia uh, those uh, magnificent uh, modernist objects were left uh, left there and uh, I'm quite intrigued by the way we uh, deal with that heritage that is some, somehow not really uh, not enough uh, perceived as a cultural heritage since someone perceives uh, a lot of people perceive uh, uh, that heritage as something too new uh, or they just perceive it as something that uh, they re relate as a past they do not want to be related with with ex country that we are not used we are not part of that country anymore um, so do you want to well I don't I think that just to kind of go back to some of the images mm -hmm. that you were sharing in the context of a lot of this research is precisely the overlapping architectural styles that coexist within the landscape of Croatia, right? So we see this eclecticism being continuously built upon each other, and these references are not only just bring the tourists, oh, sorry, the tourists to Croatia, making Croatia a destination for cultural tourism, right? Uh, to see archaeological sites, to see cultural patrimony, churches. Um, you know, that overlap Renaissance, uh, neoclassical styles. And on top of that, the, the, the modern history of Yugoslavia, right? The, the early 20th century, mid 20th century history of a particular kind of style and a kind of particular kind of view of place of uh, Croatia or the former Yugoslavia in which um, uh, the modern aesthetics would have also built a particular kind of idea of projection towards the future, a, pro a projection towards progress, a projection towards the cultural identity of Croatia that was built precisely through these architectural uh, kind of uh, dispositives, right? Um, so I just wanted to add that, like, mm -hmm. to, to really important to get the context of these things really being an existing site to site. And maybe it is important to mention that uh, you'll, see, you'll see that I'm I usually deal with the topic of uh, architecture, but in a way that uh, I perceive architecture as an image of a society that builds that, that architecture, so it could be so much more than just a, just a building, and I'm quite uh, interested in all those historical and arch architectural layers of, my, of that specific uh, region, and uh, of course I'm also... Um, I also ask myself what, what is the layer that, the architecture layer that our generation is leaving to the next generations, but we'll, we'll mention that mm. we'll mention that later. Uh, so I can start with this project uh, called Sunny Side. Uh, I'll put a lot of uh, like uh, images uh, that that are not part of the work, but uh, that will help you to understand the context. So this uh, specific uh, uh, pool, uh, swimming pool, is part of a modernist hotel uh, Zora in Primošten. Uh, designed by architect uh, Lovro Perković uh, at the end of the uh, 60s. And uh, since, I guess, uh, it's not just my association, it, it really looks like uh, some kind of a spaceship because of this futuristic, uh, fascinating uh, futuristic dome, uh, I wanted to make some kind of a work that... Uh, to build some kind of a narrative uh, 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 around that uh, amazing, amazing building. And uh, during the research, uh, I found... Um, touristic advertisement uh, for um, this hotel and uh, the Primorstein itself uh, that featured uh, Orson Welles, uh, obviously fa famous uh, movie director, and, uh, and at, at this uh, uh, image at, uh, at the left, uh, that uh, lady in, uh, in yellow suit, uh, she's uh, Oya Kodar, uh, uh, she was a partner and uh, associate of uh, Orson Welles. Uh, she acted in, in, in some of his uh, movies and since I'm from the uh, town of Šibenik, she's also from the same town and she lives in this specific uh, uh, town uh, called Primošten. So I was, uh, I was inspired by the fact uh, uh, that there is uh, proof that Orson Welles visited that specific, specific site. And uh, that's why, and uh, this is just uh, for you to uh, see how uh, this building uh, looks today, so there are some differences. Uh, and uh, this is maybe not the most important layer of the work, but uh, I also think that it is important to mention that uh, after the collapse of Yugoslavia, a lot, a lot of 
uh, important uh, buildings uh, that were designed by really important architects uh, were uh, sold by a small amount of money to some private investors uh, and they even do, do not perceive those buildings as something that is uh, that has that is more important than, than just space that you can use for your, for your own profit and then sometimes they demolish those buildings uh, and sometimes they uh, they make some changes in design because there some I guess that uh, a lot of people are, are not aware of the fact that architect, architecture is also author's work so someone made it and it's not like you although you own it it's not like you can do whatever you want to do with it uh, and so I'm interested in those uh, mixtures between contemporary visual language and, uh, for example, modernist uh, visual language that, that are not uh, so similar. And just to add to that, I think that you, as your work in particular situates itself in the 2000s, right, in a moment in which Croatia is going through this vast transformation from industry, like industrial economies into the service economy, right? So the privatization of a lot of the sites that were built for uh, for people, right? For a build for for whole society, for the society, mm -hmm. uh, we're now being appropriated and bought, and of course, um, even renovated by with private interest by private uh, mm -hmm. corporations and companies who are now trying to make profit out of this. So we see the transformations of also that uh, that landscape of modern Yugoslavian mm -hmm. um, architecture being transformed into something. It becomes a little bit like an open question. I think it's also what brings you to some of this mm -hmm. architectural motifs. Like, who, like, why, why are these architectural um, designs that are so like staples of Croatian identity and architecture have become so easily dis dis like, disposed into private hands, and for for whom are they being done? Mm -hmm. And so I started by the f like the whole narrative is built around the fact that Orson Welles. Uh, that I have approved that Orson Welles was uh, at that specific site. And uh, I, uh, since uh, that futuristic uh, dome uh, was uh, uh, built, uh, like built uh, at, the, at the end of the 60s, I was uh, inspired by the science fiction movies uh, and fashion uh, related to space age. And uh, these are just some examples uh, of the visuals that I used as some kind of in inspiration. So the way that uh, f fashion dealt with uh, uh, those images related to, uh, s to space age and uh, those uh, special effects uh, that were used, uh, for example, for filming uh, uh, Star, Trek, Star Trek or, um, or James Bond, uh, like those secret projects related to James Bond and also by uh, retro, uh, retro futuristic uh, retro futurism. Um, it's going to give you some images of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, also I was also inspired by the retro futurism because, uh, like this futuristic dome, is something that uh, I guess uh, someone in that period uh, people used to believe that we will all probably live in those, those domes and uh, uh, that future is not still here or it, who knows it, if it will ever be, mm -hmm. be here. Uh, so I was also inspired by, uh, by some of the Orson Welles' uh, works, uh, especially this uh, audio drama, War of the Worlds, where because he, uh, usually, uh, he played with the uh, a notion of uh, false and uh, f uh, what is false and what is fact. Uh, he presented uh, this uh, uh, audio drama as uh, it, it sounded like uh, real new, real news. So, uh, it, like the whole uh, drama around the U.S. Uh, uh, happened after that because uh, people believed that aliens uh, really visited, uh, re really visited uh, Earth, and uh, I was also inspired by the fact that uh, the way he uh, used to shoot his movies, uh, he would uh, invest his own money and then he would lose that money and then some, uh, he would constantly change uh, scripts and uh, uh, some of the uh, footages uh, were lost forever and uh, some uh, movies were, uh, were released after he died uh, in a version who, may, who knows what kind of, what, what version was that, was, was that even his final, his final version. And uh, so I decided to uh, make some kind of uh, imaginary narrative uh, related to uh, some kind of uh, imaginary space mission. And uh, um, I was also inspired by the way the Yugoslavia at that uh, period of uh, Cold War, um, is, uh, how do they uh, perceive the tourism? How do they present it, uh, tourism? So tourism was, 
at that time over, uh, also important uh, somehow to whole modernist project uh, in a way that Yugoslavia was part of non-alignment non -alignment movement and uh, they presented themselves in a way that uh, if you're a tourist uh, or both from uh, west or east uh, come to Yugoslavia, although we are socialist country, uh, everyone is welcome here, uh, so some kind of a tampon zone. And uh, like uh, I designed this uh, emblem, uh, some kind of a NASA emblem uh, of my uh, secret uh, space mission, but I used uh, some um, references to Yugoslavian tourism. So this, uh, uh, like my space mission is called uh, Sunny Side. And uh, I, that term uh, was part of uh, the title of the book, uh, Yugoslavia, Sunny Side of Socialism. And uh, come and see the truth uh, is uh, like a touristic slogan that was used to uh, attract foreign tourists both from uh, west and east uh, during the Cold War. Like don't believe uh, in everything that they say about socialist countries because we are somehow different. And uh, so I uh, made like a photo series. Uh, uh, those photos look uh, like uh, movie stills or uh, some uh, photos from, um, like someone uh, took a photos from uh, a movie set. And uh, I like my idea was to present uh, those photos as some uh, movie th that Orson, Orson Welles made and it, it was somehow lost and then I found those images. Uh, so this, uh, this image, for example, uh, is presented uh, some, uh, some, so this looks uh, like some kind of secret project, uh, James Bond inspired, uh, although that, uh, mo uh, that pool uh, is uh, like be uh, below the, uh, above, the uh, above the ground, like uh, uh, underground, we have something completely, completely uh, different, uh, so that, um, a pool uh, goes into the uh, to the space, uh, and uh, the, uh, in this image I uh, deal with uh, those uh, uh, special effects uh, due, that during the 60s were not. Uh, <laughs> it's not like you completely believe that, uh, like they're not uh, so per persuasive as uh, as uh, contemporary CGI uh, special effects, and uh, some of the uh, photos were. Uh, were photographed uh, in that, uh, that specific location of the pool. And some of them are, uh, were shot in a studio. And uh, after I uh, finished the project, uh, I contacted that Oya Kodar, uh, who I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the uh, presentation, uh, who collaborated and she was also a partner of Orson Welles, uh, uh, and I asked her if she could uh, somehow contribute, contribute to my project uh, because I thought that uh, if I had some proof that I contacted her, maybe uh, my story would would seem more uh, more truthful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she wrote me, uh, although you you cannot understand. Oh, it's in Croatian, but uh, even I had the problems with <laughs> with the, the, like when I received the letter. It took me some time to uh, uh, find out what what is really written. Uh, but she uh, wrote me a story about uh, how Orson uh, did not just visit that, uh, that site uh, just as a tourist, uh, but that uh, he had a similar idea to use that uh, dome of uh, Hotel Zora, of uh, swimming pool of Hotel, Zo Hotel Zora, as a spaceship uh, in a movie Don Quixote. Uh, so he had an idea to uh, uh, send uh, uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza to the moon, but he never, uh, th those, uh, those footages were never uh, recorded and uh, this movie was, never fin uh, was not finished during, during uh, while he was still alive, but uh, it was uh, released after his death. But uh, that somehow had some um, even humorous uh, layer uh, to, to the work. I really appreciate the way that the, the work, and maybe this is talking more exclusively about your practice, like how it really goes back to staging the theatrical devices, right? The, the costuming um, to integrate into a particular kind of imaginary and sunny side that is about speculation, that is about reclaiming the sites um, that once were also quite pivotal for a particular projection of place that it was delineated through um, 
you know, the expectation that tourists or visitors would come to visit uh, mm -hmm. Yugoslavia, right, or the former Yugoslavia. And so there is this, like, I love the term uh, retrofuturism because it is really about thinking about these two temporalities, the placing of something that, even though it's from recent modern history, it's really, uh, seems, you know, quite antique in mm -hmm. the new imaginaries that your like, other work uh, really talks about, which is these new constructions on the, on the side of the Croatian coast. Um, and yet we see that enormous influence that theater has had in, in your practice. And I was wondering if maybe you can go back to this relationship with, um, with filmmaking, with science fiction. Is that an entry point into your work in the ways that you were uh, then reimagining your own relationship to, 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 to Croatia, to your nation? Well, I'm always somehow inspired by the, some things that uh, were, for example, built in the uh, past, but they still exist uh, in all around us, and how do we perceive them, and how do we uh, like uh, extract the narrative out of those uh, buildings, and then I usually, uh, all my works are somehow inspired by some spe something that really happened or is still happening, something that you can still find uh, in public space, uh, but it has, uh, for example, rich, uh, rich history, and then I start with uh, I just start with the fact that something intrigues me on a visual level and, of course, in a conceptual level, and then I try to build the build a narrative around that specific uh, specific context, but in a way that uh, there's there's always some kind of a critique uh, behind it. Mm -hmm. So I never just I don't just want to make a project about just something that is some just beautiful or mm -hmm. something like that, but that has some that has a different uh, different layers. And some of those layers are good, and some of those layers are not as good. Uh, but uh, so I, a lot of those uh, photographs are photographed somewhere in a public space. Uh, and but I don't want to just uh, document something that I found in a public space. But I want to add something that uh, somehow uh, pushes uh, that location in some imaginary narrative. Uh, but still. Like still, I want to still keep uh, everything that that location ha has, uh, and uh, I'm I'm not really sure even how how that approach uh, developed, but uh, somehow I started working with those costumes because I think that it, sometimes it is enough when some location is uh, already inspiring that it is enough just to put uh, some weird costume <laughs> in that location to make it even more uh, even more. Um, intriguing uh, or to also relocate uh, once you put that figure in a costume uh, at some specific location uh, you can relocate it to, to, to for example we'll see in this uh, other project uh, something that is uh, really concrete uh, something that we can see around us when you put uh, that kind of a figure a costume mm -hmm. uh, it, it could look like something from uh, moon or you can like uh, change uh, location somehow, yeah. like completely change uh, the whole atmosphere of the, mm -hmm. of and the location. But it also occurs to me that in the time, uh, especially thinking about the space race and this kind of imaginaries of new frontier colonization through, of course, mm -hmm. um, the conquest of the moon and space at large, and how that would default, of course, in Cold War politics and had everything to do precisely in the ways in which people would have casted this idea of or the negotiations and struggles, the geopolitical struggles of the Cold War, precisely in creating new frontiers, new frontiers for visitors, new ideas of, you know, of people to visit the world. So it's not just, oh, we're tourists of the world, the concept of the 18th century, uh, the, the, you know, the European world tour concept that enabled people to feel like they could move uh, unquestionably throughout space, but that there's a new space to be to mm -hmm. be now moving into, which is outer space, right? So yeah. it's, I think that there is an interesting mm -hmm. mirroring or like echoing effect of the ways in outer space then opened a paradigm of tourism that mm -hmm. then would become so influential maybe in the Yugoslavian modernist aesthetics of this particular hotel that carries on this, this pool that like for you and for many before you even mm -hmm. already s signaled almost or casted the imaginary of spaceship and spaceship travel. Yeah, just, just that idea of having a pool as a spaceship uh, is also somehow related to a modern uh, wishes to have like that uh, space tourism and uh, yeah. like... I don't know when cruise ships were built, but <laughs> this is maybe a trope of the cruise ship uh, evolving mm -hmm. and the possibility of a swimming pool moving across 
space. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was somehow bizarre for me to imagine like swimming pool as a spaceship. <laughs> Uh, but now we can continue to a project uh, called Black Hill uh, because it also somehow deals with the uh, remnants of past uh, uh, because during the Yugoslavia all those uh, huge factories were uh, quite important part of uh, identity and uh, during the 90s after the collapse of Yugoslavia uh, majority of those factories were shut down and uh, uh, we had to deal with uh, what, what what was left uh, out, out of those factories uh, and of course uh, factories uh, like industry was uh, completely um, uh, dismantled or? Uh, that and uh, the, we started with tourism so once we had industry like heavy industry and then we uh, changed the approach and started with uh, tourism so the, the idea was uh, to erase everything that had to do something with the this type of an industry and uh, change it with uh, ch something that is related to tourism. And uh, this specific factory uh, was uh, located in a town of Šibenik where I was born and I used to live uh, near, near this factory but not, uh, not during the period uh, wh when this factory was still working but uh, during the sanation of, uh, of the ground of the factory because uh, this, is, this is an image um, where you can see how huge uh, uh, land, lo land lot of that uh, terrain of that factory was. And uh, after the factory was shut down, a lot of industrial waste uh, was left on the ground. And uh, the way they uh, tried to deal with that uh, uh, industrial waste was not as good as, as it should be because um, they did it completely in inadequately and uh, probably it, it could affect, uh, it could have affected the uh, health of people who lived around it. And uh, I was uh, somehow afraid uh, if, if it could left something on my health and uh, started to uh, research uh, the whole factory. But uh, during the research, uh, somehow I shifted to some other location that is still related to that factory in a way that uh, maybe the image is not uh, too good, but uh, I hope you understand. Uh, so um, after uh, this is a s s so this material uh, that was left on the ground is called slag. It is a byproduct of uh, production of uh, ferro alloy, and uh, they um, relocated uh, while trying to uh, clean the terrain of. Uh, uh, that X factor in Shibenik, uh, they relocated a huge amount, uh, almost uh, amount, uh, almost uh, one, uh, 160,000 uh, tons, uh, on a, in in the middle of village uh, that had that's far away from Shibenik, uh, far away from industry in a village that has nothing to do with industry, and uh, just they put it uh, there for the locals uh, who did not even know what's going on. And the uh, uh, important part of my project is also an interview with, uh, with a local uh, who lives uh, near that uh, so-called Black Hill, so locals uh, call that uh, pile of industrial waste uh, Black Hill. And, uh, but since it's in Croatia, I, you won't hear it now. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this, this is a photo series that I perceive as some kind of a photo performance. Uh, so this is that... Uh, uh, Black Hill, that uh, I was uh, intrigued by the fact that uh, those uh, piles of uh, industrial waste uh, waste uh, look like a uh, natural hill, but uh, landscape, but uh, and in the same time you feel that not, something's, something's wrong. And uh, so uh, since I was also, also inspired by the fact that uh, like a, there's a theory that uh, landscape um, uh, how a landscape influences on the uh, lives of the people uh, and uh, then I asked myself how, how does the artificial and post-industrial landscape uh, um, uh, influences on the life of the people who live in that village and uh, who are completely, they, they just don't know what to do with it, they are trying to, they, they had the protests, uh, they are trying to change the situation but uh, it's almost uh, still impossible after 13 years. Uh, and uh, I forgot to mention that this is uh, this is uh, this uh, waste is probably dangerous. It is not. Uh, it's not just that is lying there and that's it. 
so I didn't want to just to, as I previously mentioned, just to document this uh, location, but I wanted to add something that uh, that makes everything more um, intriguing or whatever. <laughs> Uh, so I made uh, this costume that is uh, some kind of a uh, mixture between protective costume and uh, folk costume uh, and the uh, design was inspired by the, by the folk costume of this specific region and the uh, local uh, embroidery that I used, that I put on, the, on this mask uh, was uh, uh, local embroidery from, the, uh, from this uh, region. Uh, it is called Četverokuka and it is a symbol of uh, hope and protection. So as some kind of uh, futile protection because uh, it, it cannot, the symbol can, cannot protect you from something that's uh, bigger than you. And uh, so these uh, photographs uh, present uh, this figure as some kind of a, a representation of the locals uh, who just cannot uh, escape from, from, this, uh, from this landscape. Um, Before we move on, but mm -hmm. it is really interesting. Like this, this kind of flips the coin completely from this more spe speculative, future-related, almost aspirational uh, thinking that Sunnyside provided to really ground, I think, the realities of the tourist, uh, the service economy, and the tourist gaze into the dire situation of the placement of toxic waste in a particular kind of community. So it's not just a transformation of industry to service economy, but the ways in which the service economy and the tourist gaze, the logic of it, has um, enabled a particular kind of ideology around the choices that are made in how to deal with waste, how to make those transformations, and who gets to deal with uh, the changes and the, 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 the waste that is left behind in favor of the sunny side uh, that favors tourists, right? The places in which tourists would never go, right? So really pushing further these communities into high-risk environments in which they have to face the waste, the toxicity of the waste, and more importantly, like you were expressing in this particular view, like being constantly uh, overwhelmed and uh, captured. So we see here a much more dystopian view uh, that I think grounds a lot of this research in the urgency that um, calls around what is really being, what is really involved when we think of the larger um, implications of the service economy, who is being prioritized in those economies, and how can the, the work really delineate you know, the, the, the specifics of, that, of those choices, but also by bringing a particular kind of fabulation to it, right? like a particular kind of narrative that is so interesting, and the work that is so uh, theatrical, like and can deploy in some of these te techniques of photo, photo performances, photo montage, where you're really, um, Theatralizing, and I wonder because we can't hear the film or the video, the interview. What were some of the testimonies of these people that are living uh, in and around this? I don't know this this uh, mountains of waste. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, like the focus uh, of the interview is more on how they used to live there than how, than on how they live now. Of course, they they mention they just feel uh, like they are trying, but they are. Help, helpless. They just don't know how to how to deal with someone who's bigger than them themselves. Uh, because uh, I mean, the whole it is difficult even to uh, speak about this uh, uh, this specific case, but because it is so complex and uh, a lot of political uh, layers are there, and uh, it is really complicated, and uh, people are just. Uh, somehow, uh, I think that they are, they decided that they, they just don't know what to do and they're just living there and um, it's almost impossible to do, to do anything. Although European Union, uh, uh, it got to the European uh, court and uh, they decided that Croatia did not uh, protect uh, its own citizens but still nothing happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So this is like ne never, never ending story somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, interesting detail uh, that here in, uh, in Shibenik, although you cannot see it uh, on this image, but they um, so on the uh, part of the uh, factory, um, on the part of the ground of the factory, uh, they built a, a beach mm. for the tourists. For the tourists. <laughs> so they replaced the ground with beaches. Okay, um, and more importantly, there's also the question of. Um, 
yeah, like again, the, the kind of lunar kind of landscapes. Mm -hmm. I think that you're going to bring it back also to space travel and mm -hmm. the imaginaries afforded to you by um, science fiction accounts. And I, I find that very interesting only because I feel like that's also has passed quite unperceived, I think, in, in popular culture, which are the real implications of outer space travel and the dispossession of people on Earth, mm -hmm. right? Like these new frontier colonization narratives of thinking of the, you know, <laughs> Uh, they, they call it the leave it or love it paradox, right? Either you love the earth and you become grounded and interconnected, or you have the impulse to leave it, leave it behind. And so, um, <laughs> outer space travel is this like, constant reassertion that there is another place where we can build our lives while trashing you know, mm -hmm. our planet. So, I think that you're really capturing some of those, the, the tensions that are also at play in many of science fiction narratives and how they're being now. We drawn to bring us back to back to Earth through the real like, the, the context of the real communities and the impact that these kinds of logics have on mm -hmm. communities that are being um, I think left behind maybe by tourism. Yes, I mean somehow it's important for me to for these uh, images to look like uh, something surreal, but they are based on something that is quite real, mm -hmm. and also and it is some kind of contemporary dystopia. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll uh, get to the uh, facade project uh, that is uh, inspired by something that happened in New York. Uh, so this is a photograph of, um, uh, this was photographed in 1931 uh, for a Beaux-Arts Beaux uh, costume uh, party. And uh, people that you see in this photo uh, are uh, architects uh, that build, that they design, they design the costumes in the shapes of the building they designed. <laughs> so th these are the real architects of, for example, this one in the middle is the architect of Chrysler Building. So all those, uh, all those uh, costumes uh, are versions of uh, some uh, buildings uh, uh, in Manhattan, and uh, architects of those buildings are dressed in those costumes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can recognize some of them. And uh, I love this photo, and I was always intrigued by it. Uh, and uh, while, while, when I did the, uh, the research, uh, I realized that uh, they, like the main idea behind it was to uh, celebrate uh, contemporary architecture and future architecture at that, at, of that period. And in the same time, they were somehow uh, celebrating themselves and th their achievements. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to uh, somehow um, start with that idea, but to put it in a Croatian, uh, Croatian context uh, and uh, in contemporary architecture of Croatia. And uh, this is something that we, I think that this is something that illustrates some problems that we uh, now deal in uh, space around us. Uh, like uh, people are obsessed with, uh, since the tourism is quite important, as I already mentioned, uh, in Croatia, uh, people are trying to earn as much money from uh, tourism and then they start to build uh, huge buildings, uh, private buildings, uh, usually am amateurish buildings, uh, but in a way that they are uh, uh, often uh, illegally built. So we have, have a lot of problems with uh, illegal construction in a way that uh, they just built without obeying any, any rules. And uh, I, I think that it is always important to mention that uh, uh, for example, uh, last few uh, earthquakes that happened uh, not only in Croatia but in Albania and in Turkey, a lot of people who died uh, in buildings uh, that collapsed, uh, build, uh, they, they died because those buildings were probably legally built and without uh, proper construction. Uh, so that, that's not, uh, although I'm in, interested also in, a, in an aesthetical part of uh, that, that kind of uh, buildings. Uh, so this is just an illustration to understand that uh, like every square meter uh, equals profit. So you need to put as much as much buildings in, in a small small space to earn, earn as much money as possible. And uh, I was also intrigued by the fact that a lot of those uh, illegally, uh, illegally built buildings uh, have some specific aesthetics that is not just uh, uh, related to Croatia, but uh, some some kind of a neo neo style uh, approach uh, that uh, I guess uh, people who build those houses uh, want to have some kind of a connection to history or something like that, uh, and uh, they are just uh, those aesthetics are not so related to our 
landscape and the way that people used to build uh, built in those uh, places. And then uh, I decided to make my version of a costume that uh, mimics the design of uh, those architects in a way that uh, I... So this is also some kind of a photo performance uh, uh, and uh, I'm the first building uh, in some locations uh, with untouched nature, uh, for example here and here, uh, but I also try to uh, try to fit in uh, some already already built uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. I think this, the two images on top are so um, I don't know, elucidating, right, of the kinds of architectural motifs that you're replicating not only with your costume but also with the concept of the neo ornament. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first met Lana, it just became really interesting to me, this attention to uh, what she called neo ornament, so the neo style as a kind of uh, attention to the ways in which there is this faux application of um, architectural motifs that go back to either uh, neoclassical styles or Renaissance Rococo styles but made in cheap materials, replicated cheaply, and add to a very quiche style, right? a quiche kind of aesthetic of colorful um, buildings and then have this kind of excessive uh, deployment of useless um, yeah, architectural motifs, they have no purpose, they have no utilitarian function, that they're just simply to decorate and add layers to the value of the property or a value to the stylistic styles that owners and property people who want to use this for private purposes, for Airbnbs and other uh, constructions, um, use them to like maybe signify a particular idea of style, a particular idea of class even, of maybe a comfort. So that's really mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, this is uh, the l last project that we are going to present. Uh, it's called uh, Batonicus, and uh, it also started with. Uh, it also deals with uh, that neo neo style uh, uh, ornaments, uh, but in in a different uh, in a different way. Uh, so I started with. Uh, I, I wrote just a small a small. So so the main idea was to present uh, some photographs that are related to my imaginary uh, theater play uh, and I wrote just a small part of the theater play, not, not the whole part, <laughs> not the whole play, uh, but, should, but should. maybe before we start the uh, one act play, uh, our reenactment, uh, then I wanted to tell us more about, again, I think going back to the question of theatricality and like, is your background in theater? Is your, do you have a background appreciation for, for performance or the performing arts in a way that has also influenced the ways in which you have approached this topic? Because there's an incredible amount of humor here. There is, of course, this uh, the passing as and the very plain reenactment of the fakeness of all of these elements through costumes seems very particular to your work. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could also give us a bit more context. Where are some of these visual vocabularies coming from? Well, I graduated in painting, so I'm not. I have. I'm not professional. Uh, professionally related to theater, although we had. I attended class uh, related to scenography, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll just show you these images uh, because that fact that I attended that class uh, somehow started uh, was a starting point of this project because I uh, like 10 years after my studies I remember that uh, our professor uh, showed us uh, he, we had like some kind of field trip during the uh, all around the theater uh, mm -hmm. Croatian theater in Split and he showed us all those uh, not just uh, like because you, you when you visit theater you just see theater play and that's it, like active uh, theater play. And uh, he showed us all those other parts of theater that are usually not visible as for the viewers. viewers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, inspired by the fact that uh, I, I somehow remember those theater warehouses that were somehow magical because uh, in the theater where warehouses you have uh, different elements of completely different stories, uh, different plays. Uh, theater plays that, that are passive, passively put uh, in the same location and uh, I was inspired by those uh, weird mixtures uh, of completely different, uh, different stories and uh, that's, uh, so the starting point of the project Petonicus uh, was the research of theater warehouses mm -hmm. but somehow it developed in, in uh, 
proper theater play <laughs> just just not, of course not proper but uh, just as a as a sketch uh, for something that yeah. that could become theater play uh, but um, i'm not uh, the thing that i'm most interested in theater is uh, the way uh, scenography functions so i'm i'm obsessed with scenography especially in scenography in public space so mm -hmm. how do we use for example here uh, how do we use some um, images uh, in a public space that uh, their purpose, although their own purpose is not scenographical, they are not part of the theater, but they use the, that uh, sceno uh, scenography approach. So you have some image uh, that uh, somehow puts you in some other context, uh, mm -hmm. so somehow relocates you somewhere else. Uh, uh, so usually I'm also inspired by those uh, uh, images that they put while uh, there's some kind of construction going on so they don't just put uh, like a, a white material but they uh, print some images uh, or uh, how this building uh, is going to look like or how this building used to look like or uh, this uh, other image related to uh, obviously tourist apartment uh, I mean for me this is a bizarre image that uh, somehow uh, like all those apartments uh, tourist apartments in Split uh, have almost the same name, like uh, heritage, heritage, uh, Diocletian, uh, <laughs> heritage, uh, this heritage, that. <laughs> so th that idea that they should put uh, uh, some kind of a sticker uh, with a golden column uh, is, for me, is bizarre and also humorous mm -hmm. in some way. Um, so I, and for example, I'm also inspired by the fact that. Uh, traditional architecture in uh, in Dalmatia was uh, uh, made of stone and that stone had a purpose like uh, why would you choose a stone as a material it was quite logical and uh, today we don't uh, houses that mimic uh, that traditional architecture are not built uh, out of stone anymore but they want to f but they still want those houses to look as traditional ones and then they use just a thin layer Thin layer of stone that they put uh, on some other material. So I'm I'm obsessed with those moments when you when one material mimics uh, the other material. Mm -hmm. And in this whole uh, project, uh, materiality of uh, of things uh, are quite quite important because, uh, like when you uh, make a scenography, as here you won't use the same material. You will you will always use something that is uh, light. Uh, of course, if you have a scenography of a, of a traditional house. You want to build a house out of out of a, a stone, but you will somehow sometimes just paint yeah. paint stones. And uh, that painted stones, you can also find them in a public space. Mm -hmm. Like people <laughs> people want their houses to look as they are made of stone, and then they just paint paint the stone. And uh, and uh, the same thing uh, happens uh, with the uh, neo neo style ornaments. Uh, they never, um, when you mimic some uh, historical uh, style, you'll never use the same material. So uh, here we have, uh, as a part of uh, Roman Diocletian's palace, we have columns that are made out of marble. But when you uh, mimic uh, that column uh, today, you will. Uh, you make it out of concrete usually yeah. Yeah. or styrofoam or something mm -hmm. like that so I'm intrigued by those changes of materials uh, and also in the context of uh, scenography yeah, that reminds me of the UNESCO of the world like Havana and all the cities that have been claimed ca cultural patrimony and then there is no funding to actually preserve some of these sites so, so there is mm -hmm. the the default option is precisely to build all these fake facades and to you know mm -hmm. um, create uh, and mimic the material but never use the original material. Um, mm -hmm. Which again is what leads you to this amazing one-act play, Betonicus, uh, that tells the story of two characters, right? Betonicus, mm -hmm. uh, the column, and Plasticus. Plasticus. And Plasticus. <laughs> Um, so we'll read this one actually really quickly because we're running out of time. But um, <laughs> so I'll just present the main characters, uh, Betonicus, and uh, Beton is a Croatian word for concrete. Uh, so since that uh, uh, character is made out of concrete, uh, so uh, Betonicus, a cement column of, uh, of the Neo-Corinthian variety, and Plasticus is PVC door, so plastic, uh, plastic door. Um, so Act 1, concrete suburbia, overbuilt an apartment building 
and plastered yet magnificently decorated in an antique fashion, illegally built but subsequently legalized. Scene one, Betonicus, alone in thought, motionless, supporting a double arch. What is the suffering of Sisyphus? What the torment of Tantalus? From, cement have I, what, from what cement have I poured in gold and silver stained, forever underneath concrete arches placed? In a dream, again, the same images appeared. Had I only in marble been carved, had I on, on the Peristyle. peristyles uh, been placed, by Diocletus' hand have I been caressed. Alas, sweet dreams were interrupted by reality and a concrete fate befallen me. The gods have no explained such inequity. Why make the stairs of marble instead of me? So may maybe just uh, a short context. Uh, uh, so Peristyle is, uh, Peristyle is this uh, square, main square of Diocletian's palace. And uh, so th that the main character of uh, theater play, uh, he's going through identity crisis because he's, as uh, all those, uh, uh, Characters of uh, Greek tragedies uh, are usually uh, they are in a place they they want, don't want to be, and he's uh, situated in an apartment building. Uh, uh, he's made out of concrete, uh, but he wants to uh, he wants to be his own original. And the main idea, uh, so his own original on Peristyle and the Diocletian himself, who who built, I mean built, uh, who who ordered uh, someone to build this uh, palace. Uh, so he wanted to have some kind of relation, I mean, that he put him uh, on uh, peristyle. And, uh, but the, the main idea behind this uh, concept was the fact that uh, neo-style ornaments, uh, uh, they act, uh, they, 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 are, they are almost a role, they are some kind of role in a theater play, so they act as their own originals. They are not they are, they are not original, but act as their own uh, his, their own originals. Uh, and I made uh, this scale model uh, that is uh, like a scale model for scenography for this theater play. And uh, I guess you can see the uh, some uh, some similarities to Paris Star Square because uh, during the summer on this uh, square we usually have a theater summer summer festival, uh, so I, although, uh, like in the same time, uh, Peristyle is mentioned uh, in a text of theater play, mm -hmm. but also it's, uh, it's imagined as a location of premiere of this, uh, of this uh, uh, theater play. And uh, I used, uh, of course, uh, the moment when they were putting the stage for <laughs> real summer, festi summer theater festival to photograph it as it looks like uh, that my theater play is going to to take place in the staging, and, then and this is, uh, this is Plasticus. Uh, I I thought that this is also an important character because uh, I some, somehow perceive it as a, a small scale devastation of a historical uh, historical uh, city centers uh, in Croatia. Mm -hmm. So this is so all the marble image. replaced by plastic. <laughs> Uh, there's so many questions here, and I'm sure that you guys have also questions about precisely this relationship between the, the, or the real and the artifice, the constantly constructed of the facades, the building of a particular kind of uh, smoke screen to mm -hmm. signal very complex issues that have to do with cultural patrimony, cultural identity, and national belonging, let's say, one that is shifting under our feet as also environmental catastrophes take over um, all of these communities who find themselves constantly at, at risk, right? At the risk of uh, earthquakes, at the risk of situations, crises, even the health uh, crisis where people are just less and less able to um, face those realities uh, collectively, right? They have less the, the social fabrics to sustain and to face vulnerabilities. And, and yet all of this being modified and molded for a particular kind of visitor, right? That has no, no sense of place. So um, maybe that's also an opportunity for all of you to, maybe, or some of you to ask some questions and follow up with you know, particularities of Lanas's work. It's really uh, interesting the fact uh, that you are highlighting some issues, like I consider them very important issues for our society. Um, since I'm Italian, I think.
think there are so many similarities to mm -hmm. the way uh, people or you know uh, architects or builders have acted on the on the landscape, and uh, so I find this very close to also to my imaginary or to my not imaginary to the the landscape I'm used to in Italy, um, and I just want like. So that that's one point. <laughs> uh, the other one is that, like maybe a question: uh, Do you think that these works are more static, as I see images on the walls, mm -hmm. and consider them more um, pictures, or do you feel they are more important as performances, the way you act in in the in the landscape or in the buildings around? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you consider them and uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. And of course, since Italy and, uh, and Croatia are so clo <laughs> close, and uh, oh, we used to share some uh, history, so uh, of course that there are a lot of, a lot of influences and uh, similarities be between our our countries. But uh, I just, uh, I mean, people is people usually ask me, do you plan to? Uh, uh, make a video or film uh, with those costumes, or do you uh, want to continue with theater play uh, to really act, uh, to really make proper theater play? Uh, but somehow I um, perceive those uh, photo series as uh, just uh, I, I'm I like that uh, approach of a fragmented narrative, and mm -hmm. I don't want to present everything, but just put some associations, put some uh, uh, symbols uh, that are obviously related to some specific problem, but uh, like to um, give uh, the viewer opportunity to put something, uh, to, to interpret it somehow, uh, however he or she uh, uh, wants to. So maybe in the future I would like maybe to experiment with something with movement, not just uh, static images, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I never consider these, although this is, uh, Photo, photo medium, I don't perceive it as a, like fo fo photography, just a tool for me to uh, catch everything that I want to. So I more perceive them as a, as a mise en scene, like uh, uh, something that is constructed uh, and uh, more important uh, for me, more is more important that costume that somehow adds to, to that location than just to have a nice photograph or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Another question coming from what you said, mm -hmm. uh, like you were in, in some images, like mm -hmm. uh, Black Hill, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm right. Uh, you were kind of acting or performing mm -hmm. in uh, an open space, also when you were wearing the pink costume. Mm -hmm. So my question is, does anyone ever notice or ask you something why you were performing or uh, working actually in uh, as never, as this never happened to you. Uh, do you mean uh, wh while I'm uh, yeah, well, you are like some uh, or, yeah. some some somehow who, someone who just passenger and yeah, uh, like I'm imagining you mm -hmm. wearing the the, co mm -hmm. the pink costumes like in front of the mm -hmm. green very <laughs> beach uh, nonsense house. So like uh, my my yeah, I'm just imagining the scene. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering. If I mean, my trick is uh, my trick is uh, to usually uh, do all those uh, photo shootings in in the dawn, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to to avoid that, <laughs> because uh, uh, especially like if you're uh, taking a photograph in front of someone else's house, <laughs> I'm not sure how how would they perceive it. Although it is uh, completely like. Uh, you, this is public space and yeah. uh, it's not like I'm doing something that, that I'm not supposed to do but uh, uh, I mean uh, every uh, while I do these kind of works is so stressful for me that I want to like to end it <laughs> as fast as possible so I, I, I'm, I always think that maybe someone will uh, like take a photo and post it, <laughs> post it on those uh, uh, photo uh, uh, those Facebook uh, pages with weird things <laughs> but it, it never happened up until now. <laughs> we'll see if, we, if it will ever happen. Thank you. Thank you for questions. Okay. Um, thank you both for the, for the talk and the introduction. 
I'm, I'm trying to solve that to formulate the question, but it's actually quite similar to what we just heard about um, Italy and, for example, me being from nearby or a small area. Like, this is something that happens there also everywhere, even though it's not maybe based on the same history. There's not necessarily a Roman palace, but there's Roman excavations. So, recently, I told you this. There's an ancient H&M store built on top of these excavations, and it's always this like constant contrast. But I was wondering, um, when you present the work, outside of Croatia, for example. Like now we have the setting with the talk, so you gave us a lot of context, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. But would you always um, contextualize it so much within Croatia? Because it's actually, actually something that is relevant for many other, many other places, and we could be, I mean, I see it at least this way, and I'm just wondering to what extent you communicate it. Um, like, is there always a text? Do you always name the places? And can you imagine it to then let it out of this and maybe like just let's say present this without mm -hmm. naming exactly what is it based on mm -hmm. like and, and if you think that this would take down a different shape and if it will affect your practice in a different way let's say if you stay here for a year mm -hmm. so there's a couple of questions there <laughs> <laughs> thank you for those questions uh well uh obviously i always start with something local and uh i think that it is important to present that uh, context because all of those works uh, need some kind of a context, at least one or two sentences. Uh, but also I don't want uh, for someone who has nothing to do with uh, our local context uh, to just look at those images and don't understand anything. So I I for me it is important to have at, at least uh, something that is, I'm trying, that's my, that's something that I try, but of course that I don't know if people w w would perceive it that way. But uh, I try to put, uh, I, I want those visuals to be somehow intriguing or uh, uh, weird enough <laughs> for someone to, under, to have some kind of interpretation, even though it doesn't have to be uh, correct interpretation or is there even correct interpretation. I, th I, I, I hope that people who uh, look at my works without knowing context that can still find something similar or something uh, that is familiar to them or for I mean especially the, that neo neo style approach uh, that's all over the world that's uh, all around the new uh, all around New York uh, but the so we have those archetypal architectural elements that just they uh, change uh, context but they tr constantly those shapes are constantly somewhere somewhere around us but uh, uh, triggered by some, usually by some, by something uh, else. So it really, uh, for example, in Bosnia, there are uh, that kind of architecture is more related to Gastarbeiter architecture with people who used to work in uh, Germany and then they will come back in, uh, in, uh, or not even come back, but uh, they will just build a house uh, that is uh, like they want to present. Uh, that they earn some money <laughs> in <laughs> Germany and then uh, they or or wherever and then they they can build build like a rich house <laughs> and how do we uh, visualize the rich houses usually people perceive ornament as something uh, as something that adds something uh, it's a class thing just because like mm -hmm. I was saying it has no utilitarian purpose it's something mm -hmm. that you would add for no good reason in your design so it's mm -hmm. add, just add costs and demonstrates that you have the, the money to flaunt mm -hmm. it um, so yeah so I think it's really interesting to also think about the the continuation of those things in interior houses for example in New York uh, recently we had this project where we were looking at um, uh, tenement buildings, which are buildings for the working class here in New York. And when you walk into an apartment in, in New York City, you walk into all these new ornaments that have no purpose, like columns sticking out of nowhere with no reason. And so you also wonder, because of the, I think the, the testament or the claim to a particular kind of taste and class and the ways in which neoclassical styles and Rococo motifs become a particular motif of like what taste is, what good living is, what an interior space looks like, and become this host's kind of co-optations of our imagination, especially in the context of what you were also describing, which is um, the, the relinquishing or devastation of modern Yugoslavian architecture and styles, and the replacement of that for a particular kind of nostalgia for the this kind of interest in classical styles, right? So mm -hmm. like the, demolishing recent history to replace that for 
antique history that really I think stay, stands as the 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 staple of what Croatian architectural landscapes would look like, what tourists are looking for when they come to Croatia. They're eager and um, wanting to see those I don't know churches, uh, palaces, and they crave that. So there's also the the replacement of modern aesthetics is also something that is. Um, benefiting a particular kind of uh, expectation and demand of the tourists to, to see what they're looking for in the, in the postcard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I forgot what I wanted to say, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say that uh, modernist architecture was uh, usually against ornament. So then mm -hmm. after after call of Yugoslavia and uh, we left that uh, that approach and then I, I had some had a feeling that have a feeling that uh, then that boom of ornament happened like it, 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 it like everyone used ornament everywhere now it's not as often as it used to be but uh, uh, I mean I'm somehow also intrigued by uh, by those ornaments because uh, even when you walk through some archaeological site, uh, when you see something that is uh, made by you, when you see ornament uh, on some uh, pillar or some face uh, on that, not some part of the uh, Roman uh, Roman uh, temple, uh, it always uh, brings some kind of excitement uh, because you know that someone made it uh, a long time ago. So I, I think that that. Something related to ornaments is ornaments is somehow inside inside us uh, something like archetypal. Uh, mm. So, so I, I some somehow makes make find it uh, and funny and intriguing and I'm uh, almost obsessed with uh, tr trying to find <laughs> those kind of ornaments uh, all around me. Any last questions? I mean, uh, those things that, that you just said uh, are something that I'm uh, researching right now. Uh, some of new new project for some of the new projects uh, because I'm quite uh, interested in a, uh, in a way a re a restoration and uh, conservation functions because there are so many different theories and and the profession itself are they are not sure how to deal with that because there are so many. Uh, completely different approaches to how to preserve heritage and how to uh, and, and, uh, it, it's important we of course that we don't want to just to like put something in uh, in inside the glass and uh, just leave it that way or just on not, because uh, especially Diocletian's palace was preserved because we, during all those centuries people uh, people stayed living there and of course, that yeah. during those centuries they uh, changed a lot of things, but in the same time they saved it. 
they devastated it at some places, but in the same time saved it because uh, that was they lived there. Yeah, the so th that's uh, almost uh, the Diocletian's the, the palace is uh, uh, proof of uh, of those. There are so many layers, historical layers there that, there that it is really intriguing to to research that. But also there are a lot of um, uh, like. Uh, research uh, researches uh, that happened uh, like uh, one century ago when uh, a lot of uh, famous um, people who are related to conservation uh, like some important minds from from that profession uh, really um, research that uh, the Occlesian's palace and uh, they presented their their own uh, ways of how they want to deal with it. So some, someone, uh, some of them wanted to demolish everything that that was built after Roman period. But of course today it 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 sounds insane because you would uh, demolish uh, some <laughs> other important historical layers. So I think that maybe the most uh, the most logical approach to that to pre to preserve. To preserve something that historically happened, because uh, we of, of, always need to understand that, uh, uh, like uh, the way we uh, the way we deal with the cultural heritage today was not the same as uh, 200 years ago, because that's almost a, that's almost a new profession, because just they didn't perceive it as a, that. This was just sometimes a, a Roman palace was just material. Because if you need to build a wall, uh, fortress, a fortress for uh, protect your own town, you will just uh, use ancient stones uh, with uh, all those beautiful ornaments and uh, just repurpose uh, repurpose materials. So, but today, uh, I just think that these images should not should <laughs> should not be, of course, uh, in in a public space because it is still possible to. Um, to appreciate the building and not to destroy it, but still live live there because there are a lot of uh, rules that uh, people who are professionals uh, in that uh, area that they uh, present to people, but they just don't want to. Sometimes don't want to listen to them. <laughs> um, Mm -hmm. from the spaceship in the 60s. That's one, one approach. Um, and there you maybe are, but you, you are a lot more active in, in your positions <coughs> around. So you're creating a story that could have happened potentially in the future that you're presenting to us. And I was just wondering, with these, with these works and, and, and images like this, do you perceive your, your part in it as a commentator or as, or as an advocate to preserve it? Or as, because it's very, it's, it's then, then it turns, the time turns, and you go a lot more back to like history, and you, and you present the, the history and all these layers that the building has, has um, experienced up until the level of now. But what would be then, would you, would you maybe work on something, or can you imagine working on something that gives then a future perspective of how you would think that this should have developed? You know what I mean? As, uh, you advocate for something? Is it like, <coughs> maybe to preserve them or to, to then change this, this, this function? Like, if you see it outside of the tourist or tourism, I know this is a topic of today, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I mentioned that those are some. To uh, I think that my future projects would would more deal with uh, how do we deal with the heritage in a more active way somehow. But uh, maybe not relate. Maybe those works w will not uh, include costumes or <laughs> something like that. But uh, uh, of course, that I'm interested uh, to think about how to actively. Uh, contribute uh, maybe even uh, I had an idea maybe to make some kind of a, a manual uh, but as an almost as a children book <laughs> uh, story book or, or on how to how to simply uh, how to present uh, some important rules in a simple way because I think that uh, uh, although there are so many rules uh, on how to uh, approach to our, how to uh, protect our heritage uh, 
sometimes they are just not presented well enough to people. So maybe there's, there's, there's a lack of uh, information, lack of, uh, lack of, um, I think that people who, who are professionals in that area, they don't, uh, um, they are not trying uh, as much as they could uh, to present uh, their approaches to, th their rules to people who are not uh, professionals. But I did just to adapt something really quickly, from looking at different case studies in which tourism has become also a very central theme for artists, including in Italy and Venice, like Salad Dogs, who have done like the um, Futuristica protests, right? Um, Venezia Futuristica. They are delineating a set of expectations and demands that are being made to the Ministry of Culture um, and Tourism. So there, I think that these, even though of course, um, these are incredible provocations that I use humor, which I think is an incredibly successful strategy for actually bringing awareness to some of these issues. I do think that there is a possibility, and this is a great question, which is the involvement of community members in thinking about how patrimony should be not only protected, but also dismantled in the, in the ideologies of the cultural nature divide. Mm -hmm. right? Like how are this patrimony being protected in light of, yes, again, tourists as opposed to the communities that live in those buildings who need to survive and flourish in those apartments that are falling on their heads or whose insights are vacuum and voided of all content because there's only preservation funding for the facade. Right, so I think that mm -hmm. maybe you will become hopefully more involved in like in the set of community demands that are being made to the ways in which preservation is to be preserved or preservation is being to be enacted, uh, especially in the context of like these beautiful enactments where you are the patrimony. It's like it almost feels like you are situating yourself in the landscape, in the cultural um, patrimony that you wish to one day see transformed for the use of your community and not for the use of people that are just passerbys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, I think that people sometimes do not even perceive these details. But when you like put them out of the context and uh, just photograph them and present them somewhere, of course that uh, it functions differently. But when you just pass by, uh, if you don't look up, you'll some maybe won't even notice uh, these details. But Marta, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I uh, answered your question. <laughs> Maybe we can continue this more informally. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lana. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you.